righteousness and wonders of his love, and wonders of his love, and wonders and wonders of his love. Birthdays. No birthdays. No birthdays. Oh, wait, do you know? It's tomorrow, the 20th. Today, the 20th. It's Patrick's birthday. 26. Tomorrow, the 27th. 26. That's today. That's today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Patrick. Patrick. And a wonderful good morning, everybody, at the Asbury class. It's good to see your smiling faces. Good I hope too. everybody has a wonderful <laughs> and a glorious Christmas. That's what he always says. Our esteemed leader is under the weather this morning, so... I'm going to sort of try and handle what we have. Is there any announcements that we have? Any business that needs to be brought up? Any complaints? Are we starting to meet next week in the on Sunday, or are we still going to Saturday? I have absolutely no idea. Okay. Well, let's just decide. You want to come Saturday next, and then we'll know? I yeah, know. I think we should, because I think there's a lot that has to be worked out. Right? Yeah. yeah. So next Saturday. Let's come yeah. next Saturday. Yeah. And then we'll have the other class here, too, right? We don't know. No. We don't. Okay. Okay, then. Okay. There, I have a thank you note from Jen Johnson's son. Dear Asbury Sunday School class, thank you so much for the gift given in honor of our dad, Jim Johnson. He was always so happy to go to church with you. The gardenia plant has been planted in the front yard and reminds me of both dad and the special people he loved so much from church. Be blessed. Jean and Myrtle Johnson, Myra Johnson, and Danny and Julie Duncan. Okay. Any, if, since there are no announcements or anything, I'll do the blessing. The, the right road. The Lord has said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I was alone in my car driving home at night when suddenly I wound up in a location I did not recognize. I guess that's welcome to the golden years. <laughs> I had been taking the wrong road and was in an area totally unfamiliar to me. My uncertainty and anxiety at that moment were disconcerting to say the least. At last I spotted a building I recognized and it serves as a point of reference. I got my bearings, and I found a road that would lead me home. This experience reminds me of those who have taken the wrong road spiritually and simply wander aimlessly through life. Many, many of them have taken the wrong road, but those roads do not lead to the joyful destination because they lead away from God. As we travel through alluring roads, it may appear that we know where we are headed, but our lives are often burdened with uncertainty and anxiety because we are disorientated, not even aware of our final destination. Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. With his help, we can find the right road and help others do the same. Let us pray. Guardian of us all, forgive our wandering ways. We lean on you to show us the path 
that leads to joyful obedience and eternal life in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Bill. Yes. And good morning, everyone, and welcome morning. to our lesson. I do hope everyone had the merriest of Christmases as we celebrated the birth of our Savior. But today is Saturday, December 26th, and the lesson that we are looking at today is dated Sunday, December 27th, year of our Lord, 2020. And this will be the last lesson of this calendar year. But we are now four lessons into our new topic titled, Call in the New Testament. These lessons will take us through all the Gospels, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, and Hebrews. All four of these initial lessons, and today is the fourth one in the series, have been taken from the book of Matthew. And these lessons focus on God's calling of individuals to specific ministries according to his plans. And just to touch on Matthew, we actually covered the book and the author a couple of weeks ago, but I wanted to reemphasize a couple of items. Matthew, the book of Matthew, is an account and testimony of Jesus Christ. It was written for the Jewish people to persuade them that Jesus was the promised Messiah. Matthew understood the importance of supporting his testimony with Old Testament prophecy, which he cited more than 50 times. I shared this two weeks ago, but I wanted to share this once more. Two of the most famous verses from the book of Matthew, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, found in Matthew 11:28, and another famous verse, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, found in Matthew 28, 19. Now for today's lesson, it is titled, Called to Prepare. And we will be reading from Matthew 3, verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. <coughs> his food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with, re with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His willowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. In Jesus' day as before, mainstream Jewish religion centered primarily on the Jerusalem temple, which was controlled by wealthy pro-Roman Sadducees, and secondarily 
on local synagogues, which often were led by Pharisees and scribal experts in the Jewish scriptures. As Jesus himself pointed out, both had become oppressive, actually hindering people in their relationships to God. The religious authorities placed heavy burdens on the average worshiper. This implied that God was not readily accessible to common people. Those authorities had developed a complex system of rules and regulations that people could not keep and could not abide by. Aside from the fact that these approaches made God largely inaccessible, they also were closely tied to the efforts of the Jewish elite to maintain peace with the Roman Empire. <coughs> Reacting to this situation, some Jews turned to Mastanic movements. Others adopted an ascetic lifestyle and sought God through seasons of meditation in the wilderness. Still others were drawn into fringe prophetic movements that promised deliverance from Roman oppression. These sometimes led to rebellion. John the Baptist's work was familiar within this religious landscape, but it was unique in two significant ways that made him a popular figure. The first of those distinctives is evident from the, from the stance we still use for him today. He was the Baptist, or the baptizer. While Jews regularly washed their hands, feet, and household items, for purposes of religious purification, including full body washings on many occasions, they washed only themselves, never other people. Such washing was viewed as a way of removing sin and impurity. In standard Jewish thinking, it was not possible for one person to remove another person's impurities. No priest or rabbi would wash someone else, not least because doing so would make the one giving the bath unclean as well. John, however, was different. His hands-on baptism served as a powerful symbol of the content of his message. That message was the second distinctive of John's ministry. He did not tell people to withdraw into the wilderness nor did he promise freedom from Roman rule. Rather, John the Baptist told them to repent in preparation for a great work of God that was looming on the horizon. John's focus on second chances and emphasis on the reality of God's presence made him a popular figure with Jews from a wide range of backgrounds. Both the New Testament and the ancient Jewish historian Josephus attests to John's popularity. His refusal to compromise and his commitment to speaking the truth ultimately led to his death at the hands of Rome's client king. The first part of the verses that I just read, we see called to testify. Starting in verse one, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. The phrase, those days, moves Matthew's story from the events of Jesus' birth and early childhood to a period some two decades later. During this time, Jesus' cousin John, the son of a priest from the Judean hill country, came to adulthood with a distinct sense of mission and calling of his own. At some point, probably during his teenage years, John adopted the lifestyle to begin to live alone in the wilderness of Judea. That location, the large desert area east of Jerusalem around the Jordan River Valley, was popular with those who wished to focus on prayer and meditation. In verse 2, and saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. John's message can be summarized in a single word, repent. 
The person who repents becomes truly sorry for past misdeeds, changes the way that he or she thinks, and, as a result, starts behaving differently. Exactly how John thought people's minds should change is not specified here. The immediate need for this change of mind was indicated by the fact that the kingdom of heaven was near. Jews would have understood that phrase both temporally as already present or coming soon and geographically as coming to Israel. As sovereign creator of the universe, God is always king over everything. But his reign was about to become evident in a, in a unique way. Repentance would make the people ready to stand in the king's presence when he arrived. The Jewish people had not had their own sovereign nation since the exile of 586 BC, except for brief times of rebellions. The people were looking for God to expel the foreign rulers in preparation to establish the throne of David. What God had in mind required different preparation than ridding the nation of outsiders. His spiritual kingdom required not a change of personnel, but a change of heart. Here as elsewhere, Matthew uses the phrase kingdom of heaven 32 times in his gospel, while Mark and Luke prefer the use of the term kingdom of God. Matthew has that five times, Mark 15 times, and Luke 32 times. Mm. Heaven in this context is most likely a gesture of respect to avoid saying God's name. Matthew's preference for this terminology has led to the conclusion that he was writing to an audience that was primarily of Jewish background. They would appreciate this gesture of respect. The phrase also recalls Daniel's prophecies of one like a son of man who is to come with the clouds of heaven. Verse three, this is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John earned the title, a voice of one calling in the wilderness from prophecy spoken by Isaiah. In its original context, the prophecy envisions God as a great king on a journey, with messengers and servants preceding him to make people ready for his arrival. John the Baptist considered himself one of these messengers, and he was announcing the great king, the Lord, and that he would appear soon. Amen. Repentance would make things straight in preparing the people for the king's arrival. We see in verse, in verse 4, John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. John's attire of rough clothing and sparse diet reflected his lifestyle. More, spe more significantly, John's choice of clothing recalls that of the great prophet Elijah. According to Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, Elijah would return one day to call the Jews to repentance before the day of judgment. John fulfilled that task in unexpected fashion. Also, verse 4, his food was locust and wild honey. Locusts were clean foods according to Leviticus 11.22 readily found in the wilderness. And honey was a key descriptor regarding the abundance of the promised land. John lived, lived off the land sustained by two foods that God provided. We see in verse five, people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Judea was the Roman province in which the city of Jerusalem was located. 
the whole region around the Jordan River extended northward into Galilee, Jesus' home territory. Since John performed no miracles, his fame as a prophet must have been based on his integrity of his lifestyle and the nature of his message. Verse 6, Confessing Their Sins. The types of sins that concern John are hinted at in Luke 3, verses 10 through 14. The very notion of the kingdom of heaven assumes that God is a sovereign ruler who must be obeyed. Confessing that one's life was not completely submitted to God was essential to the repentance that John, that John called for in preparation. Also in verse 6, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Jews were aware of the symbolism of the Jordan River. Generations before, Joshua had led the Israelites across the Jordan to claim the promised land. Now John was symbolically preparing Israel for the kingdom of heaven, whose leader was was much greater than any who had come before. Verse 7, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Some religious leaders of the day doubtless accepted John's message, but appearances of Pharisees and Sadducees rarely led to positive encounters with either Jesus or John. Because Jewish thought viewed washing purification as something that happened through rituals of personal cleansing, the leading priests and rabbis challenged John's authority to baptize. He replied with a challenge of his own, publicly identifying them as vipers. Like poisonous snakes, they hid their intentions from the masses so they could harm them. Their status as the religious elite would not exempt them from judgment, God's coming wrath. In verse 8, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. John uses the common New Testament metaphor of fruits to describe behavior based on belief. Exactly what such fruit would look like is not specified here. By comparison with a similar account in Luke 3, fruit should take the form of visible changes in behavior. In particular, actions should show that the baptized individual is obedient to divine standards of judgment, helping those in need and refusing to take advantage. The characteristic behavior of the religious elite, ignoring John's message and instead challenging his authority to preach and baptize, demonstrated that they themselves were as much in need of repentance as the masses they instructed. Rather than being arrogant, the Pharisees needed to humbly examine themselves to determine whether they were indeed prepared for the coming of God's kingdom. Verse 9, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Many Jews of John's day believed they would receive the promises made to Abraham, their father, simply by virtue of being part of the family. Although following the law became very important after the exile of 586 BC, the emphasis remained on being born into God's covenant people. John challenged this line of thinking at a foundational level. Being descended from Abraham was not proof of being in a right relationship with God. One had to seek God earnestly John's message anticipates the later New Testament teaching that salvation is based on faith, that results in obedience, never on a supposed birthright. That's right. Amen. 
verse 10, the ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. John used a dramatic analogy to drive his point home. The barren trees that should be bearing good fruit have to be marked for destruction. Without a change of heart, these barren trees would become firewood. God is patient, but his patience has limits. Mm -hmm. Those who accepted John's message would be prepared for what and who was coming. Mm -hmm. Those who did not would not participate in God's kingdom, regardless of their lineage or religious standing. It is important to recall the nature of John's audience. With the possible exception of those mentioned in Luke chapter 3, verse 14, he was not preaching to pagans. Rather, he was preaching to Jews who already believed in God and were attempting at some level to live by the law of Moses. John's audience included religious leaders who were experts in the scriptures. They needed also to prepare. The final two verses I will cover, starting with verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance. John viewed the act of submitting to water baptism as evidence of repentance. Those undergoing this baptism were admitting that they needed to change. They needed to be cleansed of sinfulness. They needed to begin producing the kind of fruit that John called for. Also in the latter part of verse 11, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John's baptism was not an end in and of itself, but rather it looked to the future. John was the Messiah's forerunner. Greater things were coming. John's baptism would give way to the baptism Jesus would bring, that is the Christian baptism. Two and possibly three actions by God lay ahead. One was the blessing that came on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the first post-resurrection gospel sermon. That message included the directive to repent and be baptized. That was directed to everyone. And it was in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Second, John predicted a fire to come. Some Bible students see this as judgment on the disobedient Others, however, see it as a purifying fire for the repentant. It could be both for a total of three things John predicted. The one to bring about such things is the Messiah. John, as a lowly servant, felt unworthy even to carry Jesus' sandals. Jesus' ministry would be greater than John's. We today can testify to that fact since we are on this side of the cross and the empty tomb. And finally, in verse 12, his will, willing fort is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Chaff is the outer husk that surrounds seeds of wheat. In antiquity, the husk was separated from the grain by tossing the wheat into the air. The chaff would drift to the side while the heavier seed fell in a pile on the threshing floor. The worthless chaff was then burned. God's unquenchable fire would be even more thorough in removing those who refused to repent. John had begun the work of separation by calling people to repent in preparation for the Lord's coming. Even today, those who repent and follow the biblical plan of salvation will be gathered up like the good grain. But those who do not will, like the useless chaff, be discarded and destroyed. 
The message is clear. Choose your fate and act accordingly before it is too late. And in conclusion, whenever a person emerges as the lone advocate for an important cause and is later proven to be right, we may refer to that individual as a voice in the wilderness. Such people often feel that way themselves, alone in their cries for change and often criticized for their views. They call others to prepare for a future that is obscure to most, but that they themselves foresee or think they foresee clearly. Like John the Baptist, these individuals are often attacked rather than appreciated. Today's lesson reminds us of the need to prepare for Christ's coming. In our case, his second coming. Part of our preparation involves serving as voices in the wilderness as we speak out against the evil we see both in the world and among God's people. Shall we pray? Father, help us to know our own hearts so that we can be ready for your son's return. Help us bear the fruit you have called us to bear and to be strong in telling others that your kingdom is near. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>